Recently, I took my first transatlantic cruise on the Carnival Venezia. The full cruise was 15 days from Barcelona to New York, and the trip included six transatlantic crossing days from the Azores in Portugal to Halifax, Canada. So, what did I think of my first transatlantic cruise? What are the pros and the cons? Would I do it again? And would I recommend that you try one? Let's find out. You're cruising with D. First, I'm going to tell you what I liked about doing a transatlantic cruise, and then I'm going to tell you what I didn't like. I put together 10 pros and 10 cons about my transatlantic experience. Then, overall, I'll let you know would I do it again, and then what is my recommendation for you. All right, number one, our first pro is lots of sea days. A transatlantic voyage means you'll have a minimum of five straight days at sea and often more. The journey I just took had six straight sea days, so they were perfect for relaxation. Instead of running off early in the morning to spend a day in port, back-to-back -back sea days give you tons of time for ship exploration or just for doing nothing. For me, this is a definite pro. I never fully relax at home. I always have work, phone calls, meetings, and appointments. The chance to do nothing on consecutive sea days is a true luxury. I can read a book, enjoy leisurely meals, have long conversations, just chill out. Also, when I got off the Carnival Venezia at Transatlantic, I felt I had left no stone unturned on that ship. I had time to explore every inch of it. Generally, when I disembark a seven-day cruise, I am sad to depart a ship and I wish I had more time. I did not feel that way when I disembarked my transatlantic. I had a wonderful journey and I was satisfied and ready to go home. Second, exotic ports of call. By exotic, I mean ports that I normally wouldn't get to explore from a cruise ship. My transatlantic took me to the Azor Islands and also to Gibraltar, two places I didn't think I'd ever get to visit. Other transatlantic cruises visit places that are very unique, like the Canary Islands. The ports of call for this trip were Malaga, Lisbon, Gibraltar, Ponta Delgada, and Halifax. My third transatlantic pro is the price. Many transatlantic cruises are repositioning cruises, where a cruise line repositions a ship between seasons, such as uh, from the summer Mediterranean season to the winter Caribbean season. The trip I was on was to get a new ship to its home port. In any event, the prices per day for transatlantic cruises are usually heavily discounted from the price per day for other cruises. The particular transatlantic we were on cost us just over $200 a day, so $100 per person per day, and that was for a Terrazza Cabana that came with a beautiful large outdoor space and tons of perks. Be sure to see my video on the Terrazza Cabanas on the Venezia if you want to know more. But my main point here is that bargains can be found for transatlantic cruises. Where on land, especially with the recent inflation, can you have an upscale seaside experience for $100 per day per person, including food and entertainment? The fourth pro to consider is no jet lag. Although Barcelona is six hours ahead of New York, on our trip for each of the sea days, we set our clocks back one hour. This gradually adjusted our time zones and gave us an extra hour for sleep or for partying for many consecutive nights. When I arrived in New York, I had no jet lag at all, which was in stark contrast to my Viking River cruise this past fall, where I suffered jet lag for well over a week on my return from Europe. This no jet lag benefit is especially nice going east to west, where you gain all those hours slowly. I think it would not be quite as nice going west to east, where you'd slowly lose all those hours, although the result of having no jet lag would be the same. Our fifth pro is no plane flight to get to or from Europe. Sometimes a transatlantic cruise will cost less than an international flight. This is also a benefit for people who don't like flying at all. I know some retired people who actually took one transatlantic cruise to Europe, toured around, and then took our cruise back to the United States. Although this is not a huge pro for me because I don't mind flying, I will admit it felt great to get back from Europe via the trip only to have to take a short, direct flight from New York to home on that last day. The sixth pro is fewer children. This is another one that can be a pro or a con, depending on your perspective. 
I enjoy a cruise with lots of children and sometimes it's fine, just like the spring break cruise on the Mardi Gras that I recently took. I loved it, but it's very nice to sometimes have a quieter cruise where there are fewer children in the pool, at the deck parties and running around unsupervised at night. All right, extra time in the casino is our seventh pro, but it can also be a con depending on your point of view. For me on this trip, it was a pro. I like to gamble, but it's hard to fit in gambling around long port days and trying to turn in early the night before for an early port call. I enjoyed having ample time in the casino and I even came home with an offer for an Carnival Ultra Gambling Cruise, which I've never done before. If you are taking a long transatlantic, it's also nice to have extra entertainment, which is our eighth pro. To supplement the usual production shows that the Venezia would have on its regular schedule, extra entertainment was brought on board. There were singers, uh, musicians, jugglers, magicians, and I think about eight comedians on board. Carnival is the best on the seas for a variety of comedians in their punchline or comedy clubs. Plus, there were at least five different groups playing music nightly in the different bars. We had live rock, Latin, blues, folk, and string music available every night in multiple venues. Extra activities, our ninth pro, are also provided for the long days at sea. On our trip, there were tons of trivia contests, so much trivia. I need to digress. There seems to be trivia games running 24 seven. Even on port days, we'd pass the trivia enthusiasts in sessions as we would head out to the port. There were also games such as bocce tournaments, bingo, enrichment lectures, a throwback day to the 1980s cruising style. There were dance lessons, um, ballroom dancing. There was a uh, retractable roof over the Lido, which was especially nice as we did have many days of bad weather on our journey, but you could still use the pool or have deck parties no matter um, how the weather was. I highly recommend a ship with a retractable roof over the Lido for your transatlantic. My 10th and final pro is being on the water and the journey aspect of a transatlantic cruise. I'll call this pro the journey. The beautiful endless water views, gorgeous sunsets, and that feeling of being on an incredible trip. I crossed the Atlantic Ocean in a ship. This is something my grandparents and my father had to do as immigrants to get to the United States. I got to experience that, to contemplate the vastness of the ocean. I got to go right by the resting place of the Titanic. And this was all a very unusual experience that not very many people get to do. So I truly enjoyed the grand voyage aspect of the transatlantic cruise. Those were my pros. Now we are next going to look at the cons of the transatlantic experience. And then I'll give you my overall verdict at the end. And I'll tell you whether or not a transatlantic voyage is right for you. You may wonder though, what drew me to taking a transatlantic? Briefly, doing a transatlantic was on my bucket list. I'd like very much to circumnavigate the globe on the ocean, although not all at one time. I've yet to do a Trans-Pacific, and uh, we are close to booking a cruise from Asia to Dubai, which would take care of another part of the world I have not yet cruised. Also, taking this particular transatlantic let me take a maiden voyage, a brand new ship for Carnival, something else I'd always wanted to do, and something I knew many of my viewers were interested in. Why are you interested or not interested in taking a transatlantic cruise? Please let me know in the comments. And if you are enjoying this video and haven't already subscribed, please subscribe to my channel. We are on our way to 1,000 subscribers and we'd appreciate your help to get there. Plus, give us a like, we appreciate that as well. All right, here we go. The cons, the negatives of taking a transatlantic cruise. My first con is it's a long voyage with lots of sea days. And yes, this first con is the same as my first pro. But here are the negative aspects of having all those sea days. You can get bored. Even with all the activities, depending on your personality, so many sea days in a row may not be for you. I love the six consecutive sea days, but my husband did not. I found this perplexing as he is retired, but evidently working in his garden was more appealing than additional sea days after about the third one. He was positively punchy by the fourth sea day. Good thing I'm here. <laughs> right? He's very useful. Which you can see if you watch the rebroadcast of our live broadcast that we did from the ship. I also think he was disappointed by the enrichment lectures, something I think Carnival could greatly improve on their journeys cruises. He also does not do trivia and the weather for the most part 
on our crossing was foggy, damp, and gloomy, so not great for outdoor activity, which I think affected his mood. Which leads us directly to con number two, the weather. The Atlantic Ocean is not the Caribbean nor even the Mediterranean when it comes to sunny days at sea. The weather is extremely variable, and it can be a bit drab and damp and also foggy. Our crossing was all three, drab, damp, and foggy. Dramp. Dramp, I think that should be a word. And so foggy. I think we spent over four full days in the fog. Heavy fog, which meant that the foghorn had to be blown every two minutes when we had the extremely limited visibility caused by the fog. <laughs> We also had rain, so for large parts of the cross, you didn't really want to go outside. I have spent the month of May in Maine, and it was foggy the entire month, so perhaps the fog is limited to late spring crossings in the North Atlantic. Before the crossing, our weather was beautiful, sunny and 70s through the European part of the trip. Other weather issues on transatlantics can, of course, include storms and hurricanes, which leads us to con number three, rough seas. My particular transatlantic didn't have rough seas. Well, we had one day with a decent amount of wave action, but nothing like the rough seas you get in a storm or squall. Plus, we were traveling slowly at 8 to 12 knots for most of the journey and closer to 8 knots on the day with the larger waves. The day with the swells did not affect me at all, but I met a lady in the elevator that evening who was positively green, and she said she hadn't left her cabin all day. Even though my crossing was relatively calm and the slow speed helped with wave action, there have been other transatlantics that are not so calm. For instance, check out some of the videos of the Carnival Celebrations Crossing. And keep in mind, if you get rough seas on a transatlantic, you are not going to see the land for days. There is no relief. So if you tend to see sickness, this should be a huge consideration. I don't get seasick at all, and in fact, I enjoy the motion of the waves. But I never take my son, for instance, on a transatlantic because he sometimes even gets motion sick in a car. Another negative for many is my fourth, which are fewer ports. Our cruise only had five ports of call, not including embarkation and debarkation. If you were having a regular two-week cruise, you could expect probably the double number of ports. So for many cruisers, like my husband, you just don't visit enough places to keep it interesting. But the cruise lines do take this account with the prices of transatlantic cruises, which is why the prices are lower. But with fewer port days, you had better enjoy the views of the water because that is basically all you will see for most of the trip. I'm going to include the internet as our fifth con. Our particular journey on Venezia had Starlink and the internet was good for the entire trip. But I've heard from many others that this is often not true for a transatlantic. And if you rely on the internet for work or messages from home, this can be a problem with five or six straight sea days and no ports to catch things up. However, even though the internet was fast on our trip, it was very expensive. Carnival requires a separate internet plan for each login. My husband and I shared a plan. This meant a constant tussle of having to log in and log out each time we wanted to use it. And when I was uploading videos, he couldn't log in for hours sometimes. The cost of the premium internet plan for the entire trip was about $300. To add another login for the entire trip would be $600 just for internet. Many cruise lines give at least two logins per plan and I wish Carnival would do the same. You should check with your cruise line to see how they deal with their internet plans and whether more than one login would be available. And expensive internet leads us to consider how those extra charges add up, which is our seventh negative about transatlantic trips. Want the drink package? That'll be $59.95 to $64.95 a day for 15 days, plus an 18% service charge. Don't want the drink package? Well, when you get bored on the sea days, drinks seem to run about $15 a drink now. And you can't purchase the drink package for part of the trip. It's all or nothing. On the third day of our cruise, we just tried to get the Bubbles soda package, and that was a no-go. The rules are all drink packages are for the entire cruise. Other expenses that can't add up? Specialty dining, 
bingo charges, gambling in the casinos, and shopping. Speaking of the casino, I had that listed as a pro, but if you start gambling out of boredom, that can easily end up also being a con when you bust your gambling budget. And the foggy days definitely saw me spending more than I had anticipated in the casino. Our seventh con is an increased chance of illness. I think there is an increased chance of illness on any long cruise, but especially on a transatlantic, and especially if you hit bad weather and everyone stays indoors for many days. On our journey, many people in my trip's Facebook group reported illnesses towards the end of the journey. I personally came down with a bad case of laryngitis the last day of the cruise that totally precluded me from taping any videos for well over a week. I did hear of a few people who tested positive for COVID when they got home, but not that many. My hypothesis is that most people were not subjected to any germs for over two years during the pandemic. And so now when they go on a cruise, especially a long one, they are more susceptible to picking up illness. That said, I also got sick on two other cruises since the pandemic, so this may not be unique to a transatlantic, but I definitely heard of more illnesses at the end of this trip than most others. The next con about a transatlantic cruise is one that you most likely will never deal with, and I hope you never deal with, but you still need to be aware of, and that is having a medical emergency while you're stuck in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. If you have a medical emergency in the middle of the Atlantic and you require more medical help than the ship can provide, you can suffer serious consequences. On our trip, one passenger had a burst appendix. Thankfully, we were only one day from Halifax when the medical emergency happened. The Canadian Coast Guard successfully evacuated the passenger. He received emergency surgery and he is recovering. But what if this had happened when we were three days from Halifax? I'm not sure that medical help could have reached the passenger in time. Of course, this is just a risk and we take all sorts of risks whenever we travel. But especially if you are in poor health, this is something you need to be aware of. And please, be sure to have medical travel insurance when you take your transatlantic. The passenger on our ship who was evacuated did not. For our ninth con, you need to know that often the passengers on transatlantics are older. This makes sense if you think about it. Older passengers have the time for a long transatlantic trip. They are often looking for unique ports or they're ticking off items on their bucket lists. And yes, I do resemble this remark. Often those on a transatlantic are veteran cruisers. On our trip, there were so many platinum and diamond carnival frequent cruisers that they couldn't be offered priority embarkation. There were simply too many of them. I think we had two first time cruisers aboard, two on the entire ship. A transatlantic just isn't usually chosen for your first cruise. This said, on our transatlantic journey, the deck parties were packed, as were the was the casino. This was not a crowd that rolled up the sidewalks at night. I did notice that the late night bars were not maybe as packed as, let's say, on the Mardi Gras or Celebration, but overall, this was a lively and fun group. But if you are looking to party the night away with 20 and 30-somethings, Transatlantic probably isn't for you. My tenth and final con is packing for a transatlantic. I had a fair amount of trouble packing for this trip. First of all, there are no stores in the middle of the Atlantic, so I was worried I would not pack something I would end up desperately needing. This happened to me when I got my laryngitis. I really wanted cough drops. I didn't bring any. No one I knew on the ship had any left, and they were not available in the shop. So overall, I tend to overpack due to what-if scenarios for a trip like this. Second, chances are good if you're taking a transatlantic, you'll need to pack for more than one climate. I knew we'd have warm weather in Europe, but what about the crossing? For that, I needed some colder weather items, and I did pack things like a windbreaker, uh, long pants, and a sweater. Oh, and a scarf, which I actually ended up using when I went outside to take photos in the fog. I didn't end up using my bathing suit at all, but I brought warm weather things like that. So prepare to pack for at least two climates. All of this makes light packing difficult, even if you have laundry services on board the ship. Okay, so there you have it, my 10 pros and cons for a transatlantic cruise. So what is my verdict? In my family, we had a split decision. I would definitely take another transatlantic cruise. The pros I mentioned really resonated with me. 
I loved how relaxing it was. I enjoyed the itinerary and that feeling of being on a great voyage. I also enjoyed the extra time to explore the cruise ship, plus the unusual ports we visited. For my husband, the answer is no. He is not interested in another transatlantic. Simply too many sea days in a row for him and not enough ports of call. He is not as avid a cruiser as I am, nor does he write and vlog about cruises. So for him, the last couple of sea days was a Groundhog Day type of experience. We are currently contemplating a cruise to South America and Antarctica, and his first question was, how many consecutive sea days are there? So I am an enthusiastic yes, and he is probably a heck no. What does that mean for you? Basically, you need to know what type of cruiser you are when considering a transatlantic. Do you love the cruising experience as much as you love traveling to new places? If so, you'd probably love a transatlantic cruise. Extra bonus points if you love to relax or want to be forced to relax by all the sea days. However, if for you, cruising is mostly about the ports you visit, then a transatlantic may not be right for you. Ditto if you think you'd just be bored with six straight sea days. And if you must have sunny, warm weather to enjoy a cruising experience, perhaps a southern transatlantic cruise is possible, but I would not recommend the North Atlantic route that we took. If you are on the fence, review my list of pros and cons and see what matters to you the most. If you are an avid cruiser, I think a transatlantic voyage is something you should try at least once for yourself. I am very glad that I did. Alright, well thank you for watching. You've been cruising with Dee.